What are we going to be? What's our biggest part that we want to play in our lifetime in this huge issue that has to do with climate change and future generations? So that's just a little nugget to say, what is your role and how do you scale your role to others? Because as Ann pointed out, advanced framing, I mean, that's a basic thing, and yet a small proportion of people are doing it. Exemplary buildings. We've got tons of examples in this room and all over. I'm going to talk about some of those. But they are still the minority. We've got excellent practitioners that know how to do things that can bring buildings energy use to very small, thus correlating to reduced energy use and hopefully fossil fuel use. They're still the minority. They're less than 10% of the population or even, even lower. We have to spread this. So in the, now I'm on slide four. They just kind of briefly cover uh, two topics fundamentally, and I'm actually going to pose a few questions, I hope. And that's um, my uh, main topic is talk about the trends. I work in commercial with this nonprofit, and we track and uh, follow the trends in zero net energy. And I'm the research director, so I follow some of the technologies, and particularly uh, he asked me to talk to, to HVAC. Um, the next slide on slide five, I believe, is um, definitions. And I only touch on this because Amy, was it? Um, Yes, Amy Ryan. Yeah, Amy and Anne. I am really sick of the, to death, of the uh, debate on terminology, and yet I am flown to D.C. for a whole year to be on a national committee to debate what the topic should be. Does net belong? Does net not belong? Honestly, honestly. So I am about, you know, let's, let's worry more about actions and words. Okay, we'll just set that aside for me. So, you know, you can, you can potato potato it all day long. But I do want you to know that in this study, these are the terms used in the study that we do uh, in tracking, and that we use the term emerging, because I think it's super important to follow and track anybody who's starting to adopt the terminology of zero net, net anything, because it shows these trends. It shows a progression of recognition. So I'm on slide six. And this is our older, we're going to update this study this October at our national conference in, in Denver. And, this, and the numbers will be updated. We at MBI, being a technical group um, working in policy research and best practices, we look at only where we can get valid data. So we have, to, we have a smaller circle that we'll, we'll screen for. So we have verified data and we have a modeled data. But we have to have seen the data, or somebody like Living Futures has to tell us they've seen it, versus you know somebody saying, I'm building one. But we'll keep it on our tracker, but we only publish ones where we can show the name of the building. You can look up the building name. You can know that we've done some screening here. So we've got, we're pushing for 400 buildings that have literally a name, address, data about every building. And if you go to the map, you can see that that's 44 states in the US right now. Every single ASHRAE climate zone which means you can't just say, oh, sure, you can do it in San Diego where it's nice and mild. You can do it in Minnesota. You can do it in Wisconsin. You know, if you've got northern climates and you've got hot, humid climates, you don't have an excuse climate-wise that it doesn't work where you live. These are the types of arguments we need to be able to respond to the, the people, naysayers who say, it doesn't work for me. It can work everywhere. And yes, California's leader, way big time leader, um, but other states are picking up on that. Next slide on eight, this is the what and where um, building type. When I started doing the, when zero net changed from energy efficiency of traditionally to low energy and now to net zero, again, the terminology, they're still low energy buildings. When it changed, we started tracking this just five or six years ago. I could show you Oberlin College, a little demonstration building. I could show you a little straw bale building that was net zero on a campus. I could show you a few small commercial buildings where the architect firm themselves built it. Now I can show you 14 building types in a range of sizes up to hundreds of thousands of square feet. That changes the market when it's replicable and you can validate and show actual buildings. And the other um, part of that is that it's natural that public buildings lead. You see education highlighted. 40% of the buildings that we have data for are schools. And that's a great first place because it influences not only the there's so many people it influences, you know, the teachers and the, and the parents and the school board members. So it's, it's beyond a public building because that parent then goes back to his company and says, oh, my kid's school is awesome, cool, you know, and they're telling me in a tour about their school and it generating energy for their classroom and they're learning about it pedagogically. So the school's a great first market, but you see we've got a real wide range of building types. 
and next slide on slide nine sizes again i used to only have little small buildings but now i've got thirty percent of the buildings are over fifty thousand square feet so well half the square footage in the u.s. and commercial buildings is under fifty thousand square feet half of it is larger and we've got to relate to those buildings as well so quantity of buildings is really large and small but square footage is about half and half of the fifty thousand square foot mark we're not talking too fast you sort of got you got me up up on the sean no, please, i got the sean thing going on to, to i'm channeling yeah. sean <laughs> trends uh slide 10 I, this is another exciting trend i get kind of excited about this. Uh, exciting trend is that we're moving beyond public to private 20 almost 25 percent of my data set is uh, privately developed buildings nobody before was doing it but the government or subsidized buildings these are uh, market leaders, as Ann was saying, when the market um, is uh, is adopting things, this is the very first movement. Because playing back to Nehemiah and Jim Wilson and others, this is one of the very first um, movements in energy where the market is ahead of code. The market is ahead of code. Some people, I mean, not the whole code. California is the only you know state that's got these adopted 2020 and 2030 goals. But practitioners are doing things well advanced of, of code in the era of net zero. And this last slide uh, on uh, trends is slide 11 on districts. So scaling to districts. So we have aggregated buildings, portfolios of buildings, cities, 2030 districts you may have heard of adopted. So we've got a, a movement that is starting to recognize the correlation between the, I forget who said that climate, I think that was Amy also, the climate action plan adopted at city level then backcasts into the need for the building sector and all the sectors. So you can work at both ends of people's agendas to, to help bring this to fruition. Uh, slide 12 is just pointing out that compared to um, standard buildings in terms of the energy use intensity, I'm very excited, I don't know if you guys are data geek people, but the, tw the, the next CBEX, which is the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey, just came out. Huge gap of 10 or 12 years. It's the only national study on what energy use is. But our, our use in the commercial sector went down for the first time in 30 years. Uh, it feels a bit like the work we've been doing has some manifestation. And so you'll see the top line is the 2003 study. And then in 2012, the average office is using like about 15% less. So the, here's kudos to people in this world that have been working on that for a long, long time. So when you say where I come from in Portland or California Title 24 or Oregon codes, they say, those codes so hard. You know, it's already too hard. There's no more energy to be reaped. You can't do better than these codes. They're really impressive. Raise your hand if anyone's ever said that to you. You ever heard that? Oh, yeah. oh yeah. there's, there's no more margin. Yeah. These buildings are... 20 or 50 to 75 percent better than that best code. So the, the other part of that yeah. argument I hear um, in dealing with TCAC is the, the building is saying, well, if it was cost effective to go beyond the code, the energy commission would have done that. Uh, it would have been in the code already. Dude. I mean, uh, it, so it must not be cost effective. Well, they must not work for the National Association of Home Builders who are there <laughs> lobbying against that code. Okay, so I'm on slide 13. Um, more than halfway through, and that's the takeaway. Yeah, we'll just move past that, that it's achievable. And then um, 14, I thought there might be some older people here, so I was going to say the who, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so who and how, that's the you topic know, two. The music is consistent. Uh, it's true. Like, you can still hear it, even though it's not the 60s, is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so those of us who have heard the who. Yeah, exactly. It's true. I love the ubiquitous nature of the so 60s right, and 70s that? music. <laughs> through generations to today. I mean, I, I just is fantastic. Who and how? And then the, and then the slide 15, I, did, I was thinking one day just a year or so ago, I thought, you know, I need to kind of look at our list and read the names of those that are that private sector. And I thought it would be really great just to throw those names on a slide. And this is, and if I'm at an event, and I was at an event with Disney, Disney is making its, its campus big in Tokyo, um, not Tokyo, um, Shanghai in China, the whole campus, the sum of all of its buildings be net zero with site TV and their low energy design and everything they're doing. So when you get corporate involvement, that's really helping to be a change agent. So is Apple part of this now that they put all the solar panels in Monterey? Apple's on here, right, right, in the, right, right dead in the middle. middle. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there it is. 
Yeah. Um, but please, as Ann requested, um, my email's at the end. We do want, you know, names of buildings and names of companies. You know, well, you don't have so-and-so. Surely we only have a small drop of them. Go ahead, Nima. So if you look on the right-hand side, about halfway down, you see Bagatellus one plan. <laughs> That's a really interesting one because because what Nick Bagatellis did was took a, a really old warehouse and it's now his factory for dynamic glazing and it is 100% Z&E. He's a great character too. Yeah. Yeah, he is a character. Is that in Reno then? The no, Reno no, that's a, in Rancho Cordova. Okay. Of Sacramento. He wants to build his next building right beside the, the factory of, of uh, Musk in Reno so that he can be supplying parts. He's, got, he's very visionary. Uh, yeah. Sean, are we going to have a, a tour of local buildings? We're not. We're not. Uh, sorry, I, I well, on Saturday, for people like here, there's lots of downtown. Uh, Let's we'll walk get that. around. But, yeah. Great area. This but you, is. Could, you yeah. could give addresses or Absolutely. where people could go and visit buildings that, that embody this uh, in this area. I like that, Austin, if tomorrow we had a list of buildings sure. to see. I'm looking over there. He doesn't know, but he doesn't know. Uh, you're so busy. Um, I'm on 18, and um, it's not what, what uh, Sean asked me to focus on, but I just use slides I have, of course, and I kind of think of these P themes of ways to get to zero. So the red is what I'm going to move to next, but I also put down at the bottom of uh, fifth P, just not to say policy, as a zero mark. Um, you know, permanent nature of a regulatory change is, is very, very powerful. But we work in all these, all these paths, all these paths that are start with keys to help change the market and change the, the energy and use. So on slide 17, um, I'm not an engineer. I'll put that caveat. I, ha I did work for an HVAC company for a number of years. I do spend my life with engineers. Pretty technically deep. I'm only going to be just on this trend topic. We have some great speakers, Dave Bash and, and others that are going to talk on the technology specific. But the trends in the buildings that I study um, are, I put that over in the red over here, forced air. Why do they call it forced anyway? Something that's so forced that is away from forced air. So that's a big takeaway that there's that the separation of thermal comfort from ventilation is a fundamental trend in zero energy buildings. You want to get a discrete ventilation source back to that controllability of ventilation and isolate it from thermal comfort. Supply your thermal comfort with a very efficacious uh, mechanism. You can ground source heat pumps. A lot of buildings have those. Um, air source heat pumps and water. Um, radiant, which is a distribution system, not a, not a generation system. So whatever your source to feed the radiant, but getting a, a radiant system, it takes seven times less energy um, well, I should say is there's seven times more energy to push air than there is to move water. So you greatly reduce the elimination of fan energy to get your thermal comfort distributed through through radiant systems. And I'm working with Berkeley right now and Glowin's on that project on the study of radiant because it is also very little used and very um, inhibited by the modeling software. So some of the outcomes will be improved modeling for radiant. This is commercial again. And trying to get some of the solutions. Ceiling fans, passive ventilation. I think you can see that just fine. And proof the possible. So I wanted to use an example. He asked for examples. This is the Bullet Building. Richard, have you heard of the Bullet Building up in Seattle? Beautiful building. Um, I know you can't see this right hand one, but I want to show that they are proportionally drawn. This is what is left side, what a typical building in Seattle uses on a KBTU per square foot per year. And the ratios here, and draw your attention here to heating and cooling, being um, together about 35%. So look, if you go to the next slide, I broke that 16 out. And now heating and cooling are only, um, no, what are they, 3, 7, 12. Yeah, 12%. The lighting ratio stays the same, but again, we're talking about 16 BTUs per square foot. But um, usually I use this slide to talk about the left-hand side, about how loads are really shifting to being driven by the occupant post-design. We're doing a great job on building a thermal envelope and lower energy systems and passive solutions and getting them designed. But then the pe those pesky people move in, another P issue. And they... Uh, <laughs> Zini buildings are easy if you don't have to put people in them. I know. It was a great building until the people moved in. I had somebody actually tell me that. It was a really great building until the people moved in. 
So just to see that this was accomplished, now how they did that is the next slide. Um, the, the, the bullet building tied envelope, always starting with the design of the envelope HVAC. You can't talk about HVAC without talking about reducing the loads that it needs to serve. And then they have radiant heating, cooling served by a ground source heat pump. So that's an example of how they got that uh, heating and cooling load to be so low. Is it really a low heating and cooling load, or is it converting heating and cooling load to pump load? Pump load for the heating and the cooling. For distributing the water. Yeah, 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 but why is pump a separate a separate part of the demographic? Are you oh you back one? You might want to forward one. You just see a lot of electrical use in pumps that didn't necessarily well, like capture the yeah. 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 Oh yeah, and we can we can talk about that. Pumping water to use takes a lot less energy than pumping air. It does. But so as a proportion of sixteen, then it's six KBTUs. Does that make sense? Unless you're pumping it up. So it becomes No, I, I mean six. for 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 ground source heat pumps there isn't that much energy for for the pumping the water yeah. to be pumped. Yeah. But it's true. So, I mean, I think he's pointed out an interesting thing. When you reduce other systems down, sometimes something that you, that's new becomes a larger percentage because it's doing a job it didn't do before, but it's still 6 kBTUs out of, of 90, think of the 90 before. It might have been hardly any before because the fans were doing everything. So this proportionality question, is, is that's a good point. And added yeah. that things that can pop out, like you no longer have the amperage capable to support such a gigantic pumps. It's not that they aren't a good use of energy, but they're in the actual in the moment amperage draw or the voltage mm -hmm. that they require can sometimes make it mm -hmm. too difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and these are just, the, the ending slides here are just examples of, of what we show in some of the case studies that, that are on our site. Um, how we use this energy formula and this term renewable production index so we can compare what's produced because an EUI is an energy use index so what we termed renewable production to be the subtractant or the additive, if you will, um, generation on site to say is it zero or better and what are some of the, the measures. So this is, and if you go to the next slide, there's a multifamily example in Portland. Uh, Walsh Construction has two wonderful case studies on their site of Ramona Apartments retrofit and then a new construction project. They just did under the passive house system, they just did a 60 unit passive house. Um, and then now on slide tw uh, 23, so in Ramona's case, there's this really older building that was using an enormous amount of, uh, of energy and although the, they didn't put hard, very much PVs on it, honestly, um, they got the energy use down to this very low energy use and it is for affordable housing. Actually, yeah. The Ramona building is a new building. It just looks old. It's, it's oh, I thought about, it was a retrofit. No, it's only about four years old. My, my son lives there. I've he lit, there. Your son lives no. there? <laughs> I speak I've, to always, you're right. I've always thought it was a retrofit no, building. It's new well, I, I was fuddled how they actually got a retrofit to 19, so thank you. EMI <laughs> 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 said someone will correct you. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Some housing design there. Um, I did want to say, speak, that makes me think of this. this point I want to make that, you know, when I've said that this can be translated across a lot of buildings now, we have the proof of possible, um, and we showed that 40% of the buildings were education. Um, in, the, in the U.S. building stock, if, if you could do all schools, I mean, do people nod your head if you think that most schools could be zero net energy? It's a great building type for zero net energy, but, you know, they're generally low rise. We get back to what debates we, we come across, we get into very high rise urban Areas and you're not going to put PV on a real tall building that's going to meet a real tall building's load. We've got to think holistically about you know supplying our, our communities with energy, but it may not be that particular building. But if we if if we got every school, half of offices which are in you know less than four stories in the suburban B class B offices or small offices, warehouses, and um, and libraries. That's half the square footage in this country, those building types. Not strip malls, warehouses, schools, libraries, and the smaller offices. Now we're not even in this debate over here. You don't have to be in there. Oh, my, it doesn't work for my building. You've got to move to where does it work. And that's an enormous amount of available and, and doable today. Um, so 24 is just another case study, and 25 shows you that I really need to make 
uh, you're aware that MBI is the main contractor with the California Public Utilities Commission. I spend a lot of time in California. And we have, on behalf of your tax dollars off your electric bills probably, um, a whole bunch of free resources on our website because their website's not quite as, as functional. There's case studies, there's talking points, there's toolkits, there's a bulletin which you should sign up for because the map I showed you US, there's a great one of California showing all the details of where commercial buildings are in California and, and names and lists so you can get those. And I'm on slide 26 and um, it could be based on time, but I need to go to 27 and I can't ask you some of the questions in dialogue, but I, well, we can do that. Thank you, Dr. Okay, well.